The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. That's NovosOrdoWatch.org. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Francis Watch on member-supported Restoration Radio. My name is Dan Fitton, your host, and today I am joined by His Excellency, Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary, Brooksville, Florida, Bishop Donald Sanborn, and Reverend Father Anthony Chicada, Assistant Pastor of St. Gertrude the Great, Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome, my Lord and Father. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here once again. Well, my Lord and Father, here we are again. This is Francis Watch episode number 30 for our listeners' benefit. Um, Who'd who'd have thought we'd be doing 30 episodes dedicated to the heresiarch Jorge Bergoglio? Well, he gives us plenty to talk about. (laughs) Plenty of grist for the mill. (laughs) Blasphemy, heresy, (laughs) stupidity, and ignorance. All, all a great mixture for a, a radio show, shall we say? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's been a been a, a while since our last show, but um, we had a, a short break because of the um, Easter period. However, my Lord and Father are back from the. Um, they're doing their sacramental duties, and they're raring to go for a bit more Bergoglio bashing. Um. Instead of our usual trinity of parts to the show this time, um, we're just going to dedicate a whole hour and a half to yours truly, Bergoglio. Um, It's been four years of Jorge Bergoglio in his non-pontificate, and I just want to take a few minutes to examine what exactly the legacy Bergoglio will leave, if he will leave, such as the death of orthodoxy, Amoris Laetitia, the the deal or uh, doom of the SSPX, and further enacting Vatican II. Now, my Lord, I know um, I was present a few, uh, I think it was about three years ago now, you did a talk um, called the Begolian Era. And I was just remarking to Father Chicada then that um, actually you would have to do that almost continuously that talk and it would grow beyond an hour's slot that you gave it to last time if if you did it now and then maybe in five years time who knows how long it would take you to get through all that it stuff. is a lot um uh, if, indeed if you um uh, try to systematize it under uh, a number of uh, different categories his uh, his basic themes are uh they seem to be the, the 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 same. One can group his his different themes together, but uh, it's uh, that you get more and more of his his crazy obsessions, uh, as it were, under uh, under each heading, uh, and there's more and more of that every year. So it's 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 an expanding um, uh, an expanding storehouse of uh, Bergoglian nonsense. Yes, frankly, I think it's been a great four years uh, in this sense (laughs) that he is the first one to unmask Vatican II. The others have always tried to put, and successfully, uh, uh, a mask upon Vatican II of orthodoxy and have deceived many, many people into thinking that Vatican II is something that the Catholic Church can live with and that it is continuity, that it is not rupture with the past, and that it's it's perfectly acceptable. Uh, this one, and that was his goal, his stated goal was really to implement Vatican II, uh, and he has implemented it, and I think these past four years have opened the eyes of quite a few people uh, to just what is exactly happening to the Catholic Church and what has happened since Vatican II. The problem, as I always say, goes back to Vatican II. It's not this or that modernist pope. It, it's it's Vatican II, uh, and this is just the unrolling of Vatican II, and he has really unrolled it. Uh, and 
Uh, he's stacked the College of Cardinals with uh, people sympathetic to himself. And I think when he passes on or resigns, uh, you could possibly see some sort of split uh, because his, his radicalism, let's call it, ha has irked so many people that uh, it, it might wake them up a little bit. Uh, I, I think that would be a step in the right direction if you had, say, two popes, <laughs> let's say. In other words... Uh, yeah, other it, words uh, uh, strange you should mention this. Uh, just this morning I got um, an email from a uh, man who apparently had spent quite a bit of time in adult parishes, etc. And uh, he said that um, uh, my prior concerns about a hermeneutic of continuity and all that malarkey weren't taken very seriously, but now the Francis pontificate has opened the eyes of many. So he goes on to announce that basically his family had become state of contests, and that it was was the Francis phenomenon that um, uh, that opened his eyes. Now whether you know this is, um, uh, we all will say that it is will be a relatively small number of people who will uh, realize this or who, who will uh, admit to it, but nevertheless, you do uh, run into them. And, and we, over the past couple of weeks, in fact, we've had a number of uh, people who have uh, visited us here or have written to us here who have said that that's it, that Francis opened uh, their eyes because it's so uh, obvious uh, that what he says is simply not Catholic and that what he represents is simply not Catholic. You know, the, the Church of Vatican II. I've, I've spoken to a lot of um, trads about this, and it, it's it's always the you know when you have the water cooler chat um, with um, another trad when you've met the first time, you you introduce yourself, and then one of the first lines of uh, conversation is how did you become a set of a cantist? And uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of a hot water cooler. Uh... <laughs> I, I find that every uh, different trads have their own road to, road to Damascus moment. And uh, oh, yeah. I mean, some people right at the start of the road, some people a bit further in, um, quite a lot towards the end. But there's always, I, I mean, there's always at some moment, um, uh, for instance, a, a South African chap I was talking to a few months ago, his moment was when they put took the candles from the kitchen table um, off the kitchen table. So that the, the 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 pseudo altar for for those uh, trads who haven't heard that term before but they took the candles off the kitchen table and put it on the floor and he said it was like a thunderbolt hitting him because he was like they can't do that despite the fact that the the the, the presbyter or the priest um toddles off to the the the, um, the tabernacle which is way in the corner you know far off and in no position of reverence at all so, yeah, stuff ends up being like the proverbial straw to break the camel's back, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and uh, you know it can it can be uh, it can be something like that that you say that that you know all of this this other nonsense I put up with and now this you know it it, it uh, uh, and it can be a little thing that really sets people off. Yes, we had a young man uh, on Sunday at one of our masses uh, who was sort of putting his toe in the tub, you might say. Uh, and uh, he said his grandmother says that all of the post-Vatican II popes are real popes except Francis. So that's a new form, I would say, of sede vacantism. But, but it does, it, it, it says something that, that you know, you know he, he is breaking that, that whole uh, system that they have, uh, that they just cannot fit him into the box. Uh, of recognize and resist and and uh, of whatever other system they have of of saying nothing has changed or you know whatever he comes from I'm not even sure where he comes from but the, the, he it just makes it impossible and so the the eyes turn towards sede vacantism uh, as, as the solution and uh, so so you know I, as I said it's been a great four years because we have seen a lot of that when he got in I knew I knew that that would be the effect. I was talking with an 18-year-old on Sunday, and for him it was the same thing. That uh, it, um, you know, he'd been trying to figure out all of this nonsense, and uh, that uh, the 
that Francis, uh, you know, pushed him over the edge. That uh, how could this be a, a true successor of of uh, uh, Peter to say the things that he says and to do the things that he uh, he does? But so people are thinking in terms of um, uh, uh, non popes. Yes, that's uh, uh, the the, the uh, well, you know, it's a start. Um, yes, step in the right direction. It definitely is. So, uh, and uh, and that was it's just the opposite uh, from Benedict's reign, quote unquote, where you couldn't get anywhere. I mean, he he was so dressed up in all of those nice things and put on a show of conservatism and the you know the great white father and the gray hair and all and. People were just so pleased to see him, and even though he is among the worst enemies of the Catholic Church uh, in what he has done from the time that he was a young priest, uh, destroying Catholic theology, and destroying uh, Catholic doctrine, uh, consecrating a bishop that openly said that Christ did not rise from the dead. You know, you, you can't get anything more basic than that. But uh, and that, now he has some uh, some job recently. Forte, I think his name is. He has a Vatican job, I think. Uh, yeah, and so you know, many other things. Uh, you know, where everyone's so horrified by Amoris Laetitia. But look at Ratzinger permitting birth control devices. But he, he was like Teflon. It was you know you, you couldn't say anything. It, it just they would their eyes would glaze over. Uh, but the the actually you know to to permit birth control devices is at least as bad uh, as as uh, Morris Letizia, if not worse you know in certain respects. Uh, but that that just blew by and nobody really cared about the fact that. Uh, uh, th those things were permitted. Uh, so, it, you know, we, we really had a hard time, not because of uh, him, but, but the, because of the perception of him. And he was very good at letting P Vatican II pass uh, with his various statements and, and, of course, all the pomp and ceremony that he would use. And uh, that uh, business of hermeneutic of continuity. And by the way, if you look at that speech, you know, he's, he uses the term of her hermeneutic of rupture and hermeneutic of continuity. He ends up that speech by saying we need the, the hermeneutic of reform. So he doesn't really hold to, to that. You know, that. He was sort of saying there's two parties and what we need is, is hermeneutic of reform, which means you know, a gradual evolution, sort of a Fabianism. You know, a little by little slice the, the salami uh, until finally it's done. Uh, I think that was his approach. That's a classic modernist though, isn't it? Your, your religion will evolve with the, with the current thinking of the times. Yes, and it's classic modernist to have the patience of a cat. <laughs> the cat waits outside of the, the wall in which the, the mouse is found, will wait and wait and wait until that mouse comes out. And so also, if you read the modernists at the turn of the century, they said, wait it out, submerge, you know, the, this, this terrible thing has happened that we've been repressed, but just stick it out and you'll see we will have our day. And I think uh, Ratzinger understood that, and he understood that if you go too fast, you're going to break it. And, uh, and that's exactly what has happened under Bergoglio, that, that the, there is a, a tremendous strain on the few people who still retain the faith. Uh, there, there are relatively few people that retain the Catholic faith. He's putting a strain on that for uh, for them to try to figure him out and to work them into work him into their system and so as i said it's been a great four years <laughs> and in a certain sense i say ad multos anos in the, you know <laughs> the, <laughs> in a certain sense uh, but i do think that maybe we're we're going to see something at at the next uh, conclave where there uh, is some sort of split i think it's highly possible because he has so stacked it that you know they're going to come up with somebody really worse than even than bergoglio and some of them might walk out or some of them might just decide we've had enough and and no I think, the, um, uh, someone has been doing the numbers on the conclave and in terms of, of the appointments 
that uh, Bergoglio has made, and I think it's it's three or four more consistories, and it will be the the majority will be uh, Bergoglians. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, there, there's going to be one on Peter and Paul, so he is is uh, stacking them, and uh, Mara Diaga, who's part of the the uh, that little council of cardinals. Remember the the guy from the Banana Republic the banana salesman, Cardinal Meridiaga, and he um, has, uh, is sort of historically a, a spokesman for um, floating Bergoglio's ideas, and he said that this is, uh, don't forget that we want to make this, uh, the, his, his, his changes in his revolution permanent, and this is how it's going to go. Yes. So it'll be an interesting thing to follow, and he will have within a couple of years uh, stacked the uh, entirely stacked the deck. There, there was um, that's that's quite a good point, Father, because there was a uh, a blog recently, the Spectator. dot uk. Um, they p- produced a, a short article saying the Pope's planning to retire um, once he's appointed enough liberal cardinals, um, and he's no. yeah so. Um, once he's got his uh, Bergolians through, um, he'll he'll go. My work is done, and uh, go and be Pope Emeritus the second, or whatever title mm-hmm. they'll cook up for him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he can he can go and play shuffleboard with B sixteen, <laughs> <laughs> or, or the old joke was like the retirees in New York. What they would do is they would get on a bus and, and go up to a casino maybe they'd go to monte carlo <laughs> together or something and uh he'd gamble some money up there and then come back you know <laughs> so uh, but it, it, the uh that's been said daniel uh, uh you know like a, a, a number of times and he's going to he's he's tipping the uh majority already you don't hear uh the conservatives uh, acclaiming, um, uh, you know, some of his cardinalatial choices as uh, as conservative, you know, you you really get uh, you really get nothing like that. No, no, I'm sure they're all. No, no, no. no um, I mean, there's there's been quite a, as we were talking on the the fourth anniversary of uh, anti Pope Francis, there were quite a few. Um, Articles in the trad blogosphere. There was one on religionnews.com which talks about civil war and fears of schism and mounting opposition. Um, and there's another one, um, Steve mm-hmm. Skojek um, writes, This man is no friend of tradition. And I was thinking, Well, he's no friend of tradition, he's no friend of Catholics. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, the Christian Post also talks about um, an Italian evangelical pastor. Um, talked about Pope Francis as dismantling the Protestant Reformation, and um, it's it's quite funny that you know three they, all these articles were you know produced relatively quite close to each other, and they talk three completely different viewpoints, which was uh, I found extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he mm-hmm. because he goes in all sorts of different directions, and uh, you know he's he's talks about the god of surprises and i mean he's the he's the pontiff of surprises isn't he and you never know what uh, uh, what he's going to do so of course people are going to be um, uh, confused in trying to uh, figure out exactly what he'll do next but it's all to it's all part of that strategy that he talked about at the beginning of uh, the uh, to make a mess the leo he he talked about and the confusion he's supposed to spread and he's certainly doing it yes he is and um, talking about um the 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 pope of surprises uh, there was a um, did any of you get the the see this there was a a conference on uh, in paris um, it was around St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th, and it was talking about um, how to depose a heretical pope. 
<laughs> so, yeah, I, had, I wonder who showed up at that. It would be great to have one of those, what, CC cameras or whatever they call it, you know, people who actually walked in. Like uh, a fly, fly on the wall type documentary. <laughs> yes. I wonder who had the guts to show up at that thing. Uh, so I, I wonder um, if, uh, so it's something that, that has taken place already, correct? Yeah, Daniel, yeah, so it? it occurred on, oh. um, happened on March the 17th, and I, I tried to, when I was doing my research for the show, I tried to find information on this um, actual um, conference and what happened, and um, the, shall we say the details are scant and sparse about it so they probably showed up with masks on you know like those masked people in berkeley you know they probably showed up with masks well, it, on it was and, uh, it, it was in paris and and, and voice concealers it was in or paris, something my like Lord, that. so I, I imagine it was some sort of venetian mask you know you with a large the large nose yes, or something yes. like that on it yes but really you don't need a conference it's in any textbook any any the ecclesia textbook that is on the church uh it's very simple I, I mean i could point it out to them if they want it you know it's it's uh or they could probably see it on youtube you know, how to depose a pope as as you can find out how to do everything else you know and it's pretty easy actually I, i'd be willing to help in any way you know it's one two three maybe we should do a youtube uh, something on YouTube, how to depose a pope. You know, that, that would, uh... It sounded like a great way to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> you know, it's a lot better than the corned beef and green beer. Well, driving the snakes out of Ireland, too, you know, that, that's uh, appropriate. Uh, but it would, be, would, would, in fact, be more interesting to find out exactly what, uh, exactly what went on with that and, and yes. kind of why and how it, was, how it came to be scheduled. Yes, yeah, that would be interesting. But uh, that that we've seen nothing on, so I guess all we can do is speculate. Yeah. So if if any of our listeners are actually uh, who who went or have an idea what happened at this conference, please get in touch. Uh, mail at truerestoration dot org. Um, so there was another. There's a. I mean, we're still in March here, so we've 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 had. Um, there's got, there's a lot of news that's come out of the Vatican, um, since then. But the uh, towards the end of March, there was a short statement by our friend Bergoglio, and um, I, I I put as my tagline, "We've been drowned in news about Pope Francis and the Vatican machinery." And uh, there's a, there's a new one here. Um, so he says. And when people who can't go to on Sunday to Catholic celebration, and I note they don't say mass here, they go to the Anglican, and Anglicans go to the Catholic because they don't want to spend Sunday without a celebration, and now they work together. Here at the Vatican, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith knows this. And um, so it's, it's, it's very strange how... Um, that we, we uh, in February we saw the the Vatican. Um, uh, there was the first ever um, Anglican Even Song, and now it's uh, more and more news coming out, um, effectively giving you the okay to go. If you don't have a mass, that's fine. You go to your local Protestant, that's fine. Um, and I'm sure there'll be, uh, you know, the sacrament issues as well will be the same as well well you'd be a lot better off going to the anglican service than to the to the novus ordo service from the point of view of catholic doctrine <laughs> <laughs> you know and belief in god say you know you might find more of it there than you would at the novus ordo uh, and certainly you're going to find uh, dignity and probably pretty good music too <laughs> so uh yeah but there's really there's no difference between the two. I mean, except that the Anglican is not as bad. That's the only thing I would say. I don't know what you would say, Father. <laughs> oh no, I, uh, you know, as I always say, that 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 it's it's um, uh, that the Novus Ordo is Anglicanism, but with bad music. <laughs> And uh, uh, you know, it's it's the 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 nature, as it were, of of uh, the nature of it were, uh, as it were, the service. But I mean, it's uh, it's uh, the Novus Ordo is conducted in such an undignified way. And if you believe that there's something sacred there, I mean, it it does show a 
um, uh, contempt for sacred things. Whereas with the Anglicans, there is, uh, you know, when I've run into it, there's always been this sort of element of, of, of at least dignity to it. You know, some fairly nice vestments I've seen in some of those Anglican cathedrals, especially on the lady priests, on the priestesses. Uh, the uh, you know, pretty nice vestments, <laughs> which you'd never find in a Novus Ordo church. So no, you would. But it's all it's all corruption and decay. I mean, you know, which one do you want? It's like two decayed teeth on w one side or the other. Which one do you want to go to? You know, I mean, it, it's it's just a corruption of Catholicism, and they just have different flavors of corruption. That's all. And uh, announcing the principle, though, that it's perfectly acceptable to go to something that's, that's uh, explicitly a Protestant service is uh, really about as outrageous as you get when you think of, of uh, you know, the uh, martyrs of the Reformation in England and what people mm -hmm. suffered who didn't go to the churches and the the, the fines and, and the persecution that was... Uh, uh, that were uh, imposed upon them. But now to say that it doesn't really make any difference uh, mm -hmm. is quite outrageous. Uh, uh, can you imagine being sat in the Church of St. Thomas More in England um, <laughs> as a Catholic going to an Anglican service? It would be very, very strange. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very I contradictory. Think most, no those Novosordites, nothing like that occurs to them. They're all evolutionists in doctrine, you know, that, well, it was true in 1530, whatever, 634, that uh, all this was bad, but now it's okay because we're different now and things have changed and we all change with it. And that, that's, the, which is, of course, against the faith. The faith assents to unchanging truths about God. And so they don't, have the virtue of faith anymore. They they believe in evolution of dogma, which kills off the faith com com completely. And so, you know, they don't care. It doesn't matter, you know. It, religion for them is, is, it's all modernist interior feeling. And uh, this service makes me feel good. I go to it and, and we all worship the same God and and we just have different ways of, of, of seeing him, that's all, and worshiping him. That's the mentality. They, they may not be so explicit about it as I have just presented it, but that's their mentality. So, um, leading on from that, um, we, in towards the tail end of March and the beginning of April, so the uh, um, the beginning of April was the the, the last two weeks of Lent. Um, you would you would think um, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church in the on this this plane of um, earthly plane um, would you know talk a little bit um, nice things about religion. Um, instead, within the space of two weeks, we had two quite major blasphemies from Bergoglio. Um, the first one. Um, was a, a a joke about the Holy Trinity, and the the second one, which is more worse than the first, was um, effectively talking about how how Christ um, became the devil. So um, the, we'll we'll tackle the first one, and so this was um, the the end of March. Um, there was an interview in uh, Crooks Now. And Dr. Emile Emisil Kulda, um, she is the first woman to receive a doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Catholic University of Argentina. So obviously she's a she's a great friend of Bergoglio, and um, she had a short meeting with uh, Francis um, uh, where they talked about theological efforts. And here's here's a new one for you, my lord. They talked about a hermeneutic of unity in difference. And um, the, the, the quote I'm going to draw um, uh, the attention to is, within that meeting, the Pope jokingly likened this uh, to the way which the Holy Trinity functions. And he says, quote, inside the Holy Trinity, they're all arguing behind closed doors, but on the outside, they give the picture of unity. Now, that's, uh, I think... Novus Ordo Watch goes into quite heavy detail on uh, how blasphemous that is, but um, just for the benefit of our listeners, my lord. 
Well, it, it, yes, it, it's, it's supreme blasphemy to, to say that the persons of the Holy Trinity argue. It's also supreme stupidity, S supreme ignorance and stupidity, the summit of both ignorance and stupidity concerning the Holy Trinity and, and the divine persons. So it's, uh, and, and it's heretical blasphemy as well. So he's got all four things. I, those are his four characteristics, is stupidity, ignorance, heresy, and blasphemy. He's managed to get all four in that one statement. Uh, and, you know, which is, you know, that's, that's quite a bit. And that's quite, quite, quite good. <laughs> uh, so, but you know that any person that pretends to have the Catholic faith could could say that. I'm mean, really, you know, it's just more of the same. I don't think the man believes in God. I think he's capable of these blasphemous jokes uh, because he doesn't believe in God to begin with. Uh, he, he, all he's concerned about is secular issues, the improvement of human beings lives on earth, uh, helping the poor, and, you know, and, but in a socialistic way, uh, and a secularistic way, naturalistic way. Uh, that's all he's interested in, and, and he regards dogma as nonsense. I mean, it's just not important for him. He doesn't, he just has no sensitivity to this. I mean, you would practically choke on saying this. Anybody that has the faith, you would, you would, I mean, it'd be like desecrating the Blessed Sacrament. It's something you would, would never come to your lips, you know? Yeah, the jaw just drops when you see something like that. I mean, it is, it's, it, it's uh, so outrageous and so blasphemous. And as Bishop Sanborn says, it hits all of the uh, uh, all of high the high points. <laughs> yeah, the high points of, of of this man's awfulness. And then you say, how can anyone defend him as the, the vicar of Jesus Christ on earth? I mean, mm -hmm. anyone who says something like this uh, that uh, you believe that someone who enjoys the authority of Peter uh, can uh, actually say something like this. You know, uh -huh. and and uh, but it, it it people become desensitized to this as well, and that's also part of his his evil genius that he says so many crazy things that the whole idea of any sort of uh, respect or deference to the teaching authority of the papal office uh, ends up uh, just going out the window because mm -hmm. he he says he pronounces so much nonsense that uh, people start to ignore it. It's just, just more static in the background. Yes, uh, it's... Uh, uh... Yes, and that's the way the anybody who continues to have the faith in the Novus Ordo has learned to do. That is, that is they uh, they ignore it. See, this is something else to ignore. They look the other way, and well, we won't pay attention to that. And that's the way they solve it. Uh, and this is heresy because there, there's one divine intellect. There's not. You see, he believes that there's three three gods essentially. Uh, and that they each have their, their uh, you know, it's just like three people sitting in a room, three different people, so to speak, uh, and not one God. He doesn't believe in, in the divine unity. And God does not change his mind. He has, uh, <laughs> everything is from eternity. Uh, there is no arguing. There is no disagreement among the persons. That would be impossible. Uh, they they all uh, you know have the 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 same thought you might say uh, so um, so there's heresy in this and that same trinitarian heresy where he said that the unity of God is God's prey that's what he called the the unity uh, of God uh, God's spray it's all it's the same it's related to it that these are are three gods so to speak arguing with each other. It sounds like the Greeks, you know, where Zeus is arguing with, with Mercury or, or Saturn or something, or more likely with, with Juno, um, who was his wife. She's probably arguing with her, most of all. And, and you know, the, these, these, uh, these humanistic gods that, that the Greeks had, this sounds like it. You know, it's paganism. And, and, uh, and you know, this just gives fuels the flames of the accusations of Muslims who say we have three gods. 
So he would say, look at this. You know, they have three gods that argue with each other. <laughs> you can't answer that. They're right. If you, <laughs> that's true. They're right. So, so you know, it, it's it, ah, just you know. But again, the the good side of all of this is that it does wake up people. So we have to look at the bright side of it. And, you know, the others, uh, I think they're gone anyway. I don't think, you know, apart from some extraordinary grace from God, I, I, they're, they're gone, just like the Protestants in the Reformation. I mean, they might trickle back one by one, but uh, on the whole, the, the Novus Ordites are, are, are gone, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, to, uh, you, you'd have thought that um, whoever would have uh, had their Damascene moment a few years ago, because um, I, I need to remind our listeners, this isn't the first time um, Bergoglio has made a joke about something sacred. Um, for example, um, back in March 2014, uh, Bergoglio made a joke about the crucifixion of our Lord. And I, I think he just thinks this whole, the whole um, Catholic religion is just a huge joke to him. And he, I mean, this is probably, this is, this is his false, um, false humility coming through. He likes to make jokes and make light of uh, very um, sacred things to demean the doctrine. And uh, I mean, uh, to, to borrow a quote from Bishop Sambo, and all you need to do is just think, is the religion of Vatican II Catholic or not? And that once you have that question, that's all you need to, you've answered that question. That's it. You just, there's, it's clear, clear as crystal, shall we say. The rest of it gets filled in something like uh, how your computer will fill in all your information on, on an application or something like that. You press, press a button and it all comes out. The rest is just filling in the blanks after you have decided Vatican II is rupture. Uh, then the logic just flows out just like a, a you know a rug <laughs> that you you're unrolling <laughs> uh, so uh, yes so we'll, we'll tackle the next blasphemy which um, I, I, I think is quite terrible but I mean um, so in his homily on April the 4th um, Bergoglio said our blessed Lord Jesus Christ made himself the devil for us now the the commentary online you can find on Novus Ordo Watch and uh, I think in this one Bergoglio's emphasizing how Christ became sin for us himself which uh, again I think is another blasphemy if uh, correct me if I'm wrong my lord it sounds Lutheran to me the the Lutheran idea now you know I maybe you know there would be a way to understand it but it sounds so Lutheran to me the Lutheran idea of the redemption was that all of the anger that God the Father had for the human race was set upon Christ and and that all of this punishment was was just thrown upon him as a way of God the Father venting his anger. That's the Lutheran idea of the redemption. The Catholic idea of the redemption is that it was an act of obedience to his father to overcome the disobedience of Adam. So that it was uh, an act of love and obedience to his father's will in order to overcome the disobedience, something like Abraham and Isaac, you know, that, that Abraham went through the obedience as Isaac did, uh, you know, at least in principle, in their minds. They both accepted this will of God. Uh, and that's what the Old Testament was built on, was that obedience and faith, both of Isaac and of Abraham. And so the New Testament is built on this, this uh, magnificent act of love and obedience for his father. That's the Catholic idea. Now, it is true that our Lord took on our sins and suffered for our sins. That's certainly true. But it, it is not this, uh, this idea that Luther had where, uh, you know, he became hateful, sort of speak, for us in God's eyes and God showered horror upon him uh, and, and uh, vented his anger as if he, God the Father had a fit. And, and finally felt better after he after seeing the crucifixion of Christ. That is the Lutheran idea of it. And this just 
uh, you know, rings of that. I, I just, uh, to become, I mean, I've never seen anybody say that Christ made himself the devil. My goodness, what, a, what an awful thing to say. Uh, he took on our sins, that's true, but uh, it is say that he became sin. Uh, uh, to me, that it, it's, it smells of Luther, but I, I would have to look it up a little bit because you, I could see somebody saying it in an orthodox sense, and that is that he took on our sins. In that sense, that's true. You know, he, 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 uh, he took on the, the, our sins in the sense that he, he paid the price for them. That's true. But I, I think... Uh, at the very least, uh, something like that is what we call in Latin male sonans. It sounds bad, at the very least. But I, I think uh, if I looked it up, uh, I, I think the, there's, there's Luther in this. Oh, well, one thing you can be sure of here is that, that Bergoglio sure didn't look it up. No, no. Nor can we presume that he meant it in an orthodox sense because he's a heretic. I think he's a, an atheist. So, you know, he has no, nothing in, that would presume in him uh, or be grounds for presumption that he meant it in an orthodox sense. Um, you know, sometimes people say things either in sermons or in you know, books or something with that, that you know, could be interpreted both ways, but if they're ordinarily a good Catholic, he would interpret it in the right way. But, you know, him? You know, after, <laughs> uh, so um, no, it it it, it it's just uh, it's something that that it smells bad. <laughs> I mean, the the interesting thing about this this whole um, homily was um, that the official text uh, available in several different languages on the Vatican website doesn't talk about devil if you do a quick search um there's no mention of the word devil throughout ah. and it's all this be became sin but the reason why i'm saying it is because the people who were actually there said that you know the first hand evidence said he said devil he said became the devil and you know we we can point to several examples of this as well um, June 15th, um, 2013, he claimed that Christ became the sinner. And um, again, in March the 15th, 2016, he said that our Lord became sin and a serpent. So this, this isn't the first time he's said or done anything like this. And it brings back to the overall theme, you know, he isn't the first time he's made jokes about the crucifixion and um, about, about anything sacred. So it's it's more of the same shall we say and he's he's very sly in doing it but i i did find it quite interesting how the vatican website censored bergoglio <laughs> 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 his his um his, his, uh, his homilies are not safe not safe for uh, catholics now <laughs> no no they have to uh, there should be a rating you know for each one um but uh, now that, that really smacks of luther really does so, someone else pointed out by the way that the um, CDF, the, the uh, Coronation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, hasn't uh, issued a uh, document, you know, sort of within living memory ever since Bergoglio's been around. Uh, it, it's that they've all sort of been put out of business or something like that. And, uh, you know, the, with Ratzinger, um, uh, when he was in charge of it and after his election, occasionally you would get uh, some sort of a, uh, a document from the Congregation of the Faith uh, on this or that point in an attempt to, to uh, explain something away or to clarify it, but now apparently they don't have too much to do. So it's, it, it's uh, um, gone from being initially as it was when it was the, the Holy Office before Vatican II as the most um, important um, uh, part of the, the curia of the Vatican bureaucracy to something that uh, is now pretty much a backwater precisely because the doctrine of the faith is not important and, and, and uh, has ended up sort of a backwater. So those uh, gentlemen, I guess, have nothing very much to do. I do. I do wonder what that, what they are up to. Do you, do you think the the cardinals are playing something like polo or croquet on the lawn uh, at the Vatican whilst uh, Bergoglio's um, you know doing their job for them? 
Oh, it was a, they're probably handing out soup in the soup kitchen or something like that. <laughs> the halal soup to Muslims. So uh, probably, probably something like that, because that's really what counts. So. Yeah. Um, um, speaking speaking of uh, Muslims, we'll, we'll talk about um, Bergoglio's trip to um, Egypt later on in the show. But um, I just want to draw um, attention. Now, I, I, I thought this, for me, this was quite witty, but I just, I, I just put the tagline, now this is just potty. And um, so this... This, um... <laughs> this is a British... Uh, uh, now, that's uh, thoroughly British. I have to remember that one for my next trip to England. I <laughs> um, so... Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> So, yes, yes, uh, this is, refers to um, the incident in Milan where um, Bergoglio decides to use a portable toilet in front of the cameras, um, um, presumably, again, wants to uh, show the world how humble he is. Um, so, I mean, that incident was covered in several different um, media outlets, uh, but the, the one I found the most interesting was um, Pathos, the blog, um, talks about this story saying, oh, he's just an old man and he needs to go to the bathroom more frequently. Um, and I think they kind of missed the whole point of why the, the trad blogosphere went a bit crazy about it. Well, I, I think the explanation was he wanted to show that he was a true successor <laughs> to Good Pope John, <laughs> as we would say in the United States. So <laughs> this is how you would do it. I don't know if that translates to, to yeah. British slang, but it, it certainly works in the United just, just, States. Just hope he hasn't gone 23 <laughs> times, eh? <laughs> It's another one of those displays that he puts on that, that is just theatrical. You know, he could have easily been led into a nice hotel or something like that, and, and people could stand around while he uses the bathroom. I mean, he has to use the bathroom. He's a human being, obviously. And uh, so, uh, but no, he, he's one of the people, and, you know, I use one of those uh, toilets, too. It was probably immaculate. It usually... The problem with the, one of those is that there's been people in there before you, but it was probably immaculate. And uh, but you know it's 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 silly. It's just showbiz. That's all it is. Well, we we were talking before about um, Bego uh, sorry Bergoglio and Ratzinger. So Ratzinger, I think, is more akin to a snake, where he you know he slithers in the background slowly poisoning doctrine but you don't see it at all because he's you know he's quite discreet whereas Bergoglio's like the clown you know he's he's all bright and frilly and he's you know say look at me look at me as he's uh um you know fumbling on the around the circus mm -hmm. type thing um yes. yeah um so uh we'll, we'll move on from uh, uh from potty gate as 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 it was dubbed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this this next one is um, from across the pond um, for me. So that's um, the Archbishop of Vancouver, um, Archbishop Miller, had a um, uh, a talk with Bergoglio for about two and a half hours, and it was reported in Momentum Veritas blogspot. And they, they were talking, actually, about uh, St. Peter. And um, I, I, this was a, uh, another quote from Bergoglio, uh, which, again, shows his um, in highly intelligent uh, view of things. Um, so the reason why St. Peter was crucified head first was so that God uh, could wash his grief. feet. Perfectly uh, asinine is, okay. is the... Look, <laughs> well, uh, total idiocy. Yeah. Uh, 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 is uh, you know, trying to pass through some sort of an insight. Uh, or even like a stupid joke. It's so stupid. Again, you know, one of his high points, stupidity. It's so stupid and not funny. Uh, you know, and and it's, it's making light of something sacred, which is the humility of St. Peter, uh, making light of that uh, so that God could wash his feet. That's like making spaghetti in heaven, you know. The grand, the Italian grandmother dies, and you know the, the funeral. The priest says that she's making spaghetti in heaven. Uh, that's typical of pagan religions to say that to extend to the next world what you're doing in this world. 
see, so God could wash his feet. Obviously, God doesn't wash feet, all right? He's a spirit. He doesn't wash feet, all right? So, but the, that idea of extending this world and the things of this world to the deity is typically pagan. And so again, it shows his, his atheism and his, his cavalier attitude toward anything sacred uh, you know, and his asininity too. If that's a proper English word, but I yeah, think you know we, what I mean. Uh, we do. I, I do, my lord. Anyway, um, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I mean that that whole um, interview uh, with Archbishop Miller. Um, they, rather than focus on you know high level doc. I mean, if if you were meeting the supreme pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church, you'd want to talk about something other than you know um, Saint Peter's feet being washed by God or uh, you know. Pure. You you want to talk about something quite high level, quite as we'd say in the UK, quite meaty. You know, something that you know resonates throughout the entire Catholic Church. But instead, um, it's reported that Bergoglio just wanted to keep the the, the, the discussion on a pastoral level and like dealing with specifics to the bodies of the Holy See. And um, it's it just smacks of um, politicians, you know, politicians kissing kissing babies, talking to the poor, you know, knocking on doors and uh, saying, "Oh, um, how can we help you today? Why don't you vote for me?" Type thing. And it's it it's the actions of um, as you know, if we haven't um, mentioned it enough already, a, a well. I'm not a Catholic for starters, but um, definitely someone who isn't head of uh, a worldwide religion. Just more stupidity, that's all. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we, we've already mentioned previously on, on this show about um, Lutherism. And we, you know, I, I secretly think that uh, Bergoglio has um, a, a bit of a hero worship complex for Martin Luther. And um, towards the end of March, he had a there was a a conference with the Pontif Pontifical Committee for Historical Sciences, and it was entitled Luther Five Hundred Years Later: A Rereading of the Lutheran Reformation in Its Historic Ecclesial Context. And in this um, in this conference, um, Bergoglio, um, well, I. I, I most of the stuff he says is quite quite boring anyway but he he one of his key things he expresses gratitude um to the god uh, for this to to for this event um <clears throat> bringing luther um and talk highlighting luther's 500 year legacy um, and he quotes it's a working of the holy spirit end quote well, Luther's a heretic, so that means the Holy Ghost must be a heretic, right? <laughs> you know, if, if what else do you? He he denied Catholic doctrine, and and you know. But again, we get down into more serious things, and that is that the man doesn't even believe in in Catholic dogma and doesn't believe in in things that are matters of faith. And so, sure, you know, why wouldn't he praise a heretic, and why wouldn't he say that the work of Luther is the work of the Holy Ghost? Sure, sure. Just more heresy, and uh, the same. <laughs> Nothing new. And, 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 and uh, the, the wave of it as you're sitting here. I mean, uh, looking at the program notes and everything, it's just a the, the wave of it just sort of washes over you. You mm -hmm. know, it's 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 mm -hmm. uh, there's one wave of stuff uh, after the other. One bit of nonsense after another, and uh, it's this way. You know, as we say, this is the, we've done thirty of these things, and it's month in and 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 um, um, a month out. The 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 giant uh, tsunami of nonsense just keeps on rolling in every it's, month. It's very easy for uh, for mm. you know, people like uh, you and I, my lord and father, to um, to get desensitized to it all because you can just go. Oh, and again, it's another one. No, oh, and another one. But I think, as we were alluding to earlier on, um, people have uh, different trads have their own uh, road to Damascus moments. So, um, whilst for you know, you and I, we're we're well along that road, and um, we we we're well aware of what Bergoglio is doing. It just 
I've been living in Damascus for a long time, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot more than me, my lord. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, a citizen of Damascus. Uh, I've been down that road a long time ago. But uh, yes, it is true, and everybody has their, their straw that will break the camel's back. I mean, and it could be a little thing. It could be some some just that that one thing that that brings it all down and and uh, you know like the putting the candles on the floor if that's all they ever did in in the Novus Ordo we wouldn't have to do Francis watch was to put the candles on the floor but it was just that one last thing <laughs> that that uh, that hit him you know and it is true that that. There is a, a a breaking point for everybody. There, there's a point where the the glass gets filled up and and it starts to overflow, and uh, so yes, so, you know we do have to be alert to all of these things. But uh, you do get jaded. You know, it, it's it's just like a, a person who is is vomiting. You know, every two minutes or something like that. You you after a while you just just there's another pot of vomit. That's all, and and. You know, so what else is new? Let's move on to the weather and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, in in polite society, there's uh, several things you shouldn't discuss, and two of them being politics and religion are high amongst them. And um, <laughs> you know, it's quite it is quite funny how in polite society they they kind of detract from or avoid the biggest topics or the the largest elephants in the in the room <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes indeed yeah <laughs> the, the 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 bigger question <laughs> We would like to remind you that you're listening to Francis Watch on member-supported Restoration Radio. I am your host, Dan Fitton, and you are listening to His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn and Father Anthony Chicada. So we've um, we've we've talked about um, the, the the tail end of Lent and um, all the all the craziness coming from the Vatican. Um, uh, f the funny thing is, every year you, you, we um, trads brace themselves for what's going to come next in Holy Week. But in actual fact, I didn't think this this year's Holy Week was um, too bad coming out of the Vatican. I don't know if you got that um, thoughts, my Lord Father. <laughs> well, that's a relative term, not too bad. The new Mass <laughs> is the worst thing that ever happened in the Vatican. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the other shenanigans are really accidental to the new mass. As Father Chikata very well said in his book, the new mass is an abuse. See, they, that, that is the central liturgical problem. It's, it's not whether he washes the feet of, of you know, Muslim girls or something. It, that really is, is all accidental to the substance of the liturgical disaster that, that has hit the Roman uh, Catholic institutions, uh, the, this, this invasion of this horrid new mass. So, you know, it was just as bad as any other Holy Week, that's what I would say, uh, because uh, of the new Mass. And, and, you know, the rest of it is, is you know, sort of accidental, you know, the, but, you know, the, the, they're sort of flashpoints. Oh, he did this or always, you know. But the, the real problem is that that horrid Mass is being said in a building that was built for the true Mass. That's, that's horrible. Yeah, and the um, uh, it's horrible in Latin, <laughs> right? You know, and if they did the whole darn thing in Latin with Gregorian chant and nice um, uh, uh, frilly lace and tasseled uh, uh, dalmatics, it represents a false religion because it 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 destroys the Catholic faith. Uh, in um, it destroys the Catholic faith, and it is sacrilegious. So no mm -hmm. matter what language you do it in, so uh, the fact, I guess, that you have, um, you know, I don't know, he had, uh, they had like Argentine tango dancing or something, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 some sort of odd um, 
musical phenomenon going on or the the, the uh, swaying people from Africa doing uh, these different dances down the aisle. It, it, it doesn't make it that that is accidental to it, but it, yet it is integral to it. Because mm -hmm. all, all of these, it, it represents the idea of enculturation and the adapting of, of uh, you know, local cultural phenomenon to uh, worship, vernacularization. All these things, they're all part of the, uh, they're all part of the system. But mm -hmm. uh, no matter, you know, uh, uh, no matter how you do it, whether you do the, the, the Mass of the Angels or the, the Tango Mass, it's it's um, uh, basically all reflects the same false ideas, mm -hmm. and does the uh, does has done terrific damage to the Catholic faith. So it was just as bad, if not worse, than all other years. That's the answer to your question. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, uh, everything is. Uh, it's when when you talk about that, my lord, you you put it you put it into perspective because, I mean. This this show we we come together every month and we talk about oh you know what's he said now what's he done now it's it's very sensationalist and um, you know I mean for for us we this show is a hook to get people um, listening more and get people thinking oh you know kind of can a pope really say that can a pope do this you know how can he how can he be that but as as my lord and father you've both banged that drum so many times it's probably worn out by now but you know is is the religion of vatican ii catholic or not and uh, that's that's the only question as as again we've we've, we've reiterated the point and uh, so uh, for for example i'm sure you know in england there were some magnificent anglican ceremonies with beautiful vestments and those those magnificent choirs that you have in england those anglican choir boys and all that 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 sing so beautifully uh but it's all false religion you know it's pretty but it's all false religion and and the 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 no matter how pretty it is the dogmas are all phony and false and and it's something that leads people to hell that, that there's pretty music or that there's you know dignity or anything else you want to say is it really doesn't amount to a hill of beans as we say in this country i don't know if you say that <laughs> but the the it's all it is is show it, it's the metropolitan opera you know or, or whatever you have over in london they you know it, it's just show and and it's entertainment but it's not religion and so, but people, you know, will sit in front of the television set and see the, hear the pretty Vatican music and see, uh, and of course the background, the setting is, is the basilica that is built for the Catholic faith. I mean, if they built their own basilica, you could just imagine what it would look like. Uh, but the, the, the background, the setting is, is so Catholic because it was built in, in the 1500s and 1600s and full of saints and all of this glory. Uh, and they're taken in by that. They think, oh, this is the you know the Catholic faith, and and it isn't. It is not the Catholic faith. Uh, th this is uh, to, to, uh, one of my famous analogies. Uh, it, it's it's like a hijacked plane. The people operating that basilica are hijackers. <clears throat> They are not the pilots. <laughs> they are hijackers, and and so they they are you know doing all of these things. And the the whole purpose of all of that is to to give a, a sense of continuity. And you cannot be sucked in by that. And people are sucked in. Uh, and uh, even your own question. And I'm not saying this to accuse you, but you said it hasn't been that bad this year. You see, and that's an indication that how a, how a lot of people think well you know we we haven't seen monkeys on the altar this year so it isn't that bad you know we're, we're yeah. it was you know tame this year because or, or the the dancing girls had some clothing on this year so you know we've gotten a little bit more conservative you know and and uh, the the uh, but that's a very grave danger because the the problem is that these are modernist hijackers who have imposed modernism in those buildings and they have to get out <laughs> and there's no catholic faith there for as long as they are there 
Oh, I was, I was, I was going to just uh, talk about the uh, your your plane analogy is the, the the perfect example. I mean, why would you get on a plane? I always use plane <laughs> analogies, by the way. I've been accused of that, and I plead guilty. It's, it's, wait, I spend a lot of time on airplanes, believe me. <laughs> so. I just just hope that plane isn't United Airlines. So. <laughs> yes. You know, the seminarian came back from Belgium on United Airlines. Just, and they announced that you cannot take videos on the airline. Okay. They announced that, yes, as he was getting on the plane in Vel Belgium, they said, you cannot take any videos on... And somebody said, hide the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So I think it makes it worse for them that you cannot take a video of what happens on an airplane. Why can't you take a video? All well, Everybody's got a camera to take a video. So uh, I think it makes it worse. So I never fly United uh, So in any case. so. But uh, yes, I use my airplane analogies all the time. So um, speaking of things not being too bad, um, the just uh, just after so this was um, just Easter Tuesday actually. This this article came out in Crooks Now. Um, so I, I'm I'm sure uh, my Lord and Father, you remember a couple of months ago we were talking about the Pope posters that appeared all over Rome. Well, ap apparently. Um, just after Easter, um, there was some Pope posters of a different nature, and these ones um, were a thank you to Pope Francis for being a true Christian and engaging with love and mercy as demanded by Jesus so often in our Holy Bible. And these posters were sponsored by the Global Tolerance Initiative, um, and <laughs> which, which I, I again, I had to Google because I didn't have a clue what the Global Tolerance Initiative was, and uh, it, it strikes a completely different chord. Um, you know, since the post of, of disunity appeared um, about two months ago, so was this George Soros or something like that? The coexist people, you know. <laughs> uh, the uh, by the way, tolerance which is thrown around so much today, means to not punish something that's evil. So the very word tolerance means that the, the object of tolerance is an evil. See, so you look the other way, you don't punish what you perceive to be an evil. That's tolerance. And so they're already admitting that <laughs> what, what they're standing for is evil. <laughs> I, I think I think my lord um I don't know if you have this expression in in the US but that exactly hits the nail on the head the definition of tolerance yes <laughs> we say that yes uh and they don't mean tolerance at all they mean approval yeah so you are meant not to tolerate you are meant to approve and applaud and they might as well just say it that that whatever you feel like doing, whatever gives you pleasure, is good, and and just get it over with, you know, which is essentially hedonism. You know, the first hedonist church of Rome. I'm guessing I'm guessing tolerance is one of the great virtues of modernism, anyway, <laughs> because uh, you you basically tolerate all faiths, all creeds. Um, pay, uh, you know, you tolerate people who mm. murder babies. You tolerate corrupt governments. You. You, you tolerate everything because you're a good Catholic in the, in the Novus Ordo, if you tolerate that. Yes, and tolerance is not a virtue at all. It is, it is actually an act of prudence it, in the sense that in some cases it is good to tolerate. In other cases it is evil to tolerate. So if you tolerate something that it could be very pernicious, uh, it, it's evil. Look at, the, look at Berkeley. They will not tolerate a, a right-wing speaker. See, because in a certain sense, they understand this correctly, they are right in saying, well, this is something that we consider to be fascism, and we cannot tolerate fascism. And, it, you know, if that were true, if it were fascism, of course you could not tolerate fascism. You see, so, so the, the, the truth by its very nature is intolerant of its opposite error. You know, error and truth uh, cannot coexist. It, it's by nature intolerant. And so at least those people in Berkeley who are beating up uh, conservatives uh, are consistent. <laughs> I'll give them that. They're consistent. 
in a certain sense that that they say that leftism is is truth and therefore those who oppose leftism have to be suppressed so that that's uh, at least they believe in something uh, they, as they believe in one of the properties of truth I will say that for them that it is absurd to to have two opposite things uh, held up as truth that's absurd so, so uh, now I think they're all evil I think there are a bunch of evil leftists and communists but at least there is a certain consistency there now they're inconsistent however let me finish in claiming free speech back in the 1960s they were claiming free speech Berkeley the University of California at Berkeley was the center of the free speech movement, you know, and, and f academic freedom. And that was free speech for the leftists. <laughs> but now that they have control, there's no free speech for anybody else. That's known as liberal fascism. And our country is loaded with it. You, you've always said, uh, my lord, uh, that there's no one, no one more dogmatic than a liberal. That's correct. Yes. Which is quite quite ironic, actually, because you you look at um, Pope Saint Pius X in his encyclical Pascendi. Uh, I think the best way he said to deal with modernists was to hit them and beat them with sticks. You do not count the blows. You do not measure. He, them. he didn't say sticks. He said fists. fists sorry, fists. <laughs> 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 yeah. So he said that uh, he was he himself said he, that he had a tendency to anger, and uh, so he probably said that in a. In a moment of anger. But I, I think the, the point was that these people, these modernists, he was responding to a, uh, a somebody who was saying, oh, you're going too hard in these modernists. And he was saying, you know, you don't understand. You're a very important person. These people are the worst enemies of the church and we have to repress them. That, that was the point of that. You know, maybe, you know, he, he uh, uh, you know, lost it for a minute, but the, the and I, I still, you know, love that quote, but the, the point is that tolerance is not always a virtue. In many cases, it's a vice, and it can cause some very terrible problems by tolerating things that ought not to be tolerated. Uh, the, you can only tolerate where the repression of the evil would cause a greater evil than what the evil itself is. You see, so typically civil war, if civil war would erupt by, by repressing some evil, then it's legitimate to tolerate the evil. But you always have to weigh in a question of tolerance, what, what, which is the worst evil? And sometimes the worst evil is to let it go, is to let the whatever it is fester and, and, and spread. So, you say, for example, you don't tolerate an infection. No, you don't. No. You don't say, well, you know, it's, it's just an infection. It might take over your whole body. It might kill you. You know, if you don't stop an infection, uh, you could die. You could get sepsis. The you know infection of the blood, uh, and then it's just a question of days. So you know, there's there's no tolerance. Your body doesn't tolerate anything. It sends out those antibodies and starts attacking, whatever it is. The body doesn't tolerate anything. So, so you know, it's so tolerance. Though I mean, that word tolerance means the object of tolerance is always an evil. So they're admitting evil. They don't mean it that way, though. They mean approval. They don't mean tolerance. They mean approval. And that everything's true, and you know the, the whole rainbow approach and diversity and and all of that garbage. And it, it is good, I think, uh, to make that distinction, uh, to point that out to people when they talk about being tolerant. To point out that that in fact the the object of it is an evil, yes. and it's it's an admission that's in an evil that it is an e evil because. Yes. It, as His Excellency says, uh, generally by tolerance they mean uh, approval, and you can't let that slide by. Uh, it's just like when you say, when you try to excuse something because somebody doesn't know any better or uh, wasn't paying attention, you're admitting that what they did was objectively wrong, but they're excused by their lack of attention or lack of knowledge. But what they did was objectively wrong. See, there's a saying in in moral theology, 
ignorance excuses, but it does not justify. See, so it, it, you're excused from sin, but nonetheless, objectively, it was a sin. So as, as we're still on the subject of tolerance, um, I'd, I'd like to move on and talk about um, uh, one of Pope Francis's latest appointees. Um, so if, if anyone is still under the impression that Bergoglio is a tough opponent of homosexuals and their agenda, um, please be disabused of this illusion now. So on April the 12th, um, 2017, the Vatican announced that Pope Francis had appointed the notorious Jesuit LGBT hyphen sensitive or whatever they like to be called this week. Um, There's Father a James lot more Martin. letters after that uh, now. <laughs> as, you know. I know it was. It's one of those things. It's like Francis's doctrine. It changes with the week. You know, it, it <laughs> yes. changes with the wind. <laughs> yes. Because now there's so, gender neut neutral, where you're ne neither nor. So that's the latest thing. Yeah, it's sort of like the ongoing alphabet soup, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> How many characters can you That'll get That'll be something one? to pick up at the supermarket soon, is like LGBT soup, and all the other letters that, yeah. You know, well, that sounds like a sandwich, doesn't it? Like BLT or something like that. So, uh, in any case, um, so the um, LGBTQ plus X Y Z Alpha Charlie Bravo, wh whatever it is, this term is this week. Um, um, Father James Martin, who's um, he's now a consultant for the Vet Vatican Secretariat for Communications, effectively the um, conglomerate of um, which includes the, the Holy See Press Office, the Vatican Radio, Vatican Television, Vatican Publishing and Vatican Internet, amongst others. So uh, effectively, um, Bergoglio has put um, the most, shall we say, um, biased person on LGBTQ plus XYZ, whatever it is this week, um, relations in charge of the Vatican mouthpiece. Now, just to further muddy the waters here, um, a brief bio on Father Martin. Um, he became a Jesuit in 1988 and obviously was a big, it was a Novus Ordo, um, received the Novus Ordo Rite of Ordin Ordination. He is currently editor-at-large of the um, Jesuit Review America, and over the years he's made himself a name um, as a cheerleader. Uh, that's a good good uh, US term, that, for, for lefty, leftist causes. Um, and um, he ha his recent work, um, bear with me, listeners, is... Um, entitled Building a Bridge, How the Catholic Church and the LGBT Community Can Enter into a Relationship of Respect, Compassion and Sensitivity. And I think that title there tells you everything you need to know about the latest communications director for the Vatican. <laughs> the approach to those people is that you are involved in sins against nature and that you must give up your sins against nature in order to approach the sacraments of the Catholic Church. That is the relationship that the Catholic Church has toward LGBT people. And, and that the, these inclinations that you have toward this sort of thing are disordered. As their own catechism says, the 1992 catechism says they are intrinsically disordered. And, and so and which is absolutely true. It's a, just a disorder. I mean, whatever the origin of it is, it's a disorder. And they need to lead a, a life of chastity, just as everybody else has to lead a life of chastity, each according to his own state. That's all there is to say about it. And that's all you'll find in Catholic moral theology books and pastoral theology books. It's just another sin that needs to be addressed. And and uh, it's a, you'd say, a special sin, I would say, in the sense that it involves uh, a rebellion against God and against nature in a very special way. Uh, but in any case, it's a sin and it needs to be treated as such. So, you know, uh, I always, uh, you know, I know it might sound like a broken record, but I, I would 
uh, take out LGBT and put the sadomasochists, how building a bridge, how the Catholic Church and the sadomasochists community can enter into a relationship of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Why, why is that, you know, that might sound shocking, oh, terrible, you know. But if you're saying that your inclination justifies the object of your inclination, the fact that you are inclined to it makes the object justified, then any sort of awful inclination that you might have, the most perverse, wicked things that could come to your mind would be justified by the fact that you are inclined toward it. So that's, that's, the, uh, th that's what's in this thing, relationship of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. As if these people, as they are sinners, in as much as they are sinners, have some sort of, uh, are, are the object of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. That they are not. As they are sinners, they are odious in God's sight, as they are sinners. And, and the church in all charity needs to tell them that and needs to preach to them that they must repent. That's the attitude of the Roman Catholic Church toward that. Do you want to add anything to that, Father, or have I pretty much said it? <laughs> bizarre, the bizarre thing about this is uh, even their own uh, psychiatrists, their own psych psychological uh, manuals, the, uh, they call it, it was, it was something with, uh, in fact, it was something with letters, uh, the um, diagnostic and statistical manual, something like that. The the shrinks used to um, uh, uh, put labels on psychiatric and psychological disorders that people had up until relatively recently uh, treated this as uh, a, a, as uh, something being wrong with a person that you were messed up. Uh, psychiatrically, from a psychiatric point of view, uh, if you were part of the LGBT community, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but it was only something that's relatively recent now that uh, this has become uh, uh, this has become acceptable, and it's again it's the the the, the um, uh, changing of of uh, societal norms and the uh, delinkage of um, uh, of of uh, the marital act and, and uh, all the things that are connected with that from um, uh, uh, reproduction and procreation. So I mean, up until a couple of years ago, this was regarded as if if if, if uh, you were into this sort of thing, uh, it was regarded as a problem. As you say, you know, like what's next? And the uh, already you have people talking about decriminalizing bestiality. Yes, yes, that's, that's on the move, yes, that's right. That's right. You know, and then uh, also the idea of uh, the um, uh, incest, uh, that uh, uh, there's nothing particularly wrong, I guess, with incest. Yes, I've seen that too. Uh, the idea of, of uh, a sexual uh, predation on kids under the age of puberty, that that's, um, uh, there's the, 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 the move always to lower the age of consent. Okay, and uh, they had that in, uh, in England. I think it's 16 now, and your, your so-called gay lobby lobbied for that. They wanted to get 14. Yeah, that's okay, just true. The, the lower the age of consent. And then the argument for it is that, well, that, that, uh, is that you relabel things. Uh, you relabel this to be uh, like uh, intergenerational affection or something like that, mm -hmm. and that's how you uh, and that's how it works. But it's it's um, uh, you know as I say, uh, up until relatively recently, uh, the even seculars announced realized that there was something wrong with this. And that it wasn't entering into a relationship of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. That that wasn't the way to go. And the reason for this is, is not respect, re, uh, compassion, and sensitivity toward these people. First of all, they represent a small minority. But, but the most important thing is to tear down the natural law. This, it, it, this, which affects so many other things. And this whole idea of trying to make uh, an, an unnatural sin something natural and good 
rips down the natural law. Once you rip down the natural law, you're, you're dead. And, and it is a, you know, just a complete moral revolution to do that. And they're using this precisely to, to rip down the, the natural law. So that's, that's the greater effect of it. You know, that, that you have some people running around doing this sort of thing. It is, you always will have that. And it's always existed in history. But the, the, the real problem, the worst problem, is that society is meant to look upon it as something good and acceptable. That is the, a far worse thing. And it is the perversion of society, which is worse actually than the perversion uh, that those sexual acts represent. Do you, do you think that um, the, the appointment of uh, Father James Martin as the, the Vatican spokesperson, given his already um, quite, um, his, his liberal views on uh, LGBT, etc., do, do you think that marks a change? Do you think we'll see um, Not at acceptance all. of... Not at all. He's the one, Bergoglio's the one that was holding hands with the homosexual activist priest outside the church for some sort of homosexual mass, I think it was. I mean, wasn't that about two years ago or so? Yeah, and then the, there was, was, there's was, a, was, yeah. pictures of it. Yeah, well, there's a picture of that poor creature who was like a former student, I don't know, male or female, uh, uh, someone who had a sex change operation and then, uh, you know, yes. married someone else, supposedly, uh, standing there with Bergoglio. So the thing is that he doesn't need James Martin. No. He sent out all the signals. And, you know, who am I to judge? Remember that? Yeah. That, and remember the, 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 the watch band, the rainbow watch band in June? The picture of, you know, yep. like the, you know, like, oh, Oh, you know, somebody took a picture of his watch band. He held it out, obviously, for people to see. How could you get such a, a picture of somebody's watch band uh, like that? Uh, he purposely had that on, and he perp that p picture purposely was went out uh, in order to show solidarity with all of the uh, homosexual parades that happened in June. So this is this is small potatoes in comparison. That he puts, you know, one of these people on there—it's—it's uh, it's really nothing. Yeah, it's, uh, the the uh, carpet has been pulled out from underneath this one uh, a while ago. Virtually from the beginning, it was with, within the the, the first uh, year of his election. Mm -hmm. uh, he he started backpedaling on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you you mentioned um, uh, queer marriage before, Father. I mean, in, in I know you, you several states in the U.S. have legalized um, homosexual marriage or unions or whatever um, we want to call them, but the Supreme Court did. In in the U.K., we had the, uh, several years ago we had the Gay Marriage Act, um, but the the precursor to the Gay Marriage Act was um, civil partnerships, which was effectively all the um, legal benefits of being married it's just you, you just don't get married in a church which you know in, a, in an increasingly secular society who wants to do that but the the interesting thing and the interesting case um, I, I just want to point out recently was a heterosexual couple a man and a woman didn't want to be married um, or formally married in a church or, um, you know, a, have a marriage ceremony. They instead wanted to get a civil partnership and um, they challenged the court and the court denied them because um, they have marriage. It said, well, you can just get married. But they said, well, we didn't want to do that. We want to be civil partners. The The homosexuals can do it. They can either have, they've got the choice, you know, they can either be uh, civil partners or be, you know, quote, married. Um, and that's, that's a very interesting thing of how the, the, the majority uh, or an example of how the majority is being discriminated against by the state. Just, I mean, it's, this is in the UK, but I'm sure there are cases in all over the world where this is happening. Um, f because of the the in inclusion and the tolerance of LGBT people. Well, so many laws regarding married people, uh, property laws and, and divorce laws, etc., regarding married people, and there are no laws uh, regarding civil union people. See, so civil union, you, know, you can just walk away from a civil union. Uh, you don't have all of those horrid divorce laws. 
Uh, and uh, so that might have something to do with it. In, in the Nova Sordo, you could walk away from a marriage. You just, you just get an annulment, don't you? Yes, get an annulment. <laughs> and, and even if you don't, you just go to Holy Communion anyway. Only yeah. after you do a discernment, though. You have to Obviously, do a discernment. The, uh... Uh, that should be on YouTube, too. How to do a discernment, you know, like putting your head in your hands and well, doing all sorts of, you know, dramatic things, and then you emerge from the discernment. And a discernment simply means that you decide that what you want to do is is okay with God. That's a discernment. You know, if you're inclined to something, you have a discernment, and then you're okay. It's like the eighth sacrament, the discernment. Maybe, maybe Father Chicada, your next video, you could do a YouTube video on discernment for, for the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, there there are a lot of people who discourage me from doing videos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I, ju I just want to uh, move on to um, uh, the the next topic. So we, we've um, we've we've talked about um, Bergy as uh, you know as as the the tolerant man um, as the the Joker. Um, uh, I, I think I'm, uh, this next um, little article I, I, I quite like. So this was in um, Le Stampe, and this was on the 24th of April, um, uh, last, just last month. And um, this this is, again, um, Bergoglio's war on rigidity, so i.e. trads, or people who actually hold the Catholic belief. Um, so uh, again, in another another. Um, homily in another speech he said um he, he quotes um the he, he reaffirms no to a, a rigid faith and um appeals to reject compromises and idealizations that would diminish the concreteness of the christian faith and are not compatible with the freedom that the holy spirit gives and he also laments with bitterness and that's uh, that's a quote in the article that um he the church has fallen into a theology of yes you can and no you cannot um i'm pretty sure the church has always had a theology of yes you can and no you cannot <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's that's objective truth isn't it well the very fact that he complains about it means that he's saying no we shouldn't have a theology of yes or no he contradicts himself. It's like the skeptic who cannot get out of his own circle, his, his own vicious circle. Uh, if he's saying this is bad, that we have a theology that's yes or no, he's saying no to that. See, so he's already... He's saying it's bad, so... Yeah, yeah it's bad. It's really bad. And, and so... Uh, uh, and then uh, he uh, he says uh, uh, in another time though uh, he urges Christians to quote give up double life no more <laughs> dirty businesses. Well, what is he saying? He's saying no. I mean, this again is asininity, stupidity. What is moral theology all about except to determine whether something is in conformity with God's law or not? That's that's what your that's what conscience is about. Something is in in conformity with God's law or not. What is he talking about? So, so that that for our listeners, um, I will put the picture as the the tagline for our um, show for the show. But um, effectively, on the same page of the same newspaper, they had um, a Bergoglio's head title of the church has sometimes fallen into a yes or no. And then directly underneath that article, almost in your face, is the words, um, Pope urges Christians to give up double life, no more dirty uh, businesses. Um, so it, it, is, it is a sublime contradiction of himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if, and he's I don't know the if... one that is constantly attacking anybody with a rosary or with, the, you know, happens to believe in God or happens to believe in dogma. And he attacks them viciously. Who is he to talk? Who is he to judge? <laughs> yes, who is he to judge? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Only the rigid get just judged. <laughs> yes. It, it's it, he must have a very very fine his his version uh, um definition of rigidity must be like an elastic band. You know, it stretches and wanes, stretches and wanes, and has actual no, uh, you know, no, no rigidity to it at all. Rigidity for him means pre-Vatican to Catholicism. 
That's his code word for it. And he hates pretty, it. Pretty much. He hates yeah. it. I mean, I, I heard um, earlier on in the year there was a planned conference for the youth on rigidity. It was on, a, I think it was on Twitter. I saw a a, a brief, um, I, I saw, you know, a brief, it was a brief tweet that flashed up. I saw it and, and didn't think of anything of it. And so far I haven't heard if he's going to counsel the youth on rigidity, but um, yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. They have to be rigid against rigidity. <laughs> so we'll we'll move on to our last uh topic of the show um so this was it's fairly fresh in our minds um it was bergoglio's visit to egypt um and the, the tagline under arabic i may add is pope of peace in egypt of peace um which doesn't isn't really good English there, but <laughs> <laughs> this is after what they blew up a bunch of Christians, a bunch of cops. The, uh, exactly. This is the Egypt of peace. Yeah, this is the Egypt of peace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he, um, I mean, if you look on uh, Nova Sordo Watch, um, the, the tagline I, th I thought was quite funny was. Uh, um, Francis, a.k.a. Pope Shake, as, as he's now known, uh, <laughs> has scheduled another one of his infamous apostate, um, crossed out apostolic journeys abroad, this time to Egypt. Um, so it, on looking at the, the press coverage for this trip, I, um, I, uh, you know, he, did, he did, his, did his usual stuff. He went to meet the Muslims. He, he spoke to um, Sheikh Ahmed al Tayeb. He talked to the uh, the Catholics in Egypt. He talked to the Orthodox people, um, and he, he just did more of more of the same as we, we always like to say. Um, but it was it was quite funny how uh, well actually it's, it's not funny but it's ironic how um, he he likes to um, apologize on behalf of Catholics um, everywhere. And, you know, he goes to a Muslim country and is instantly deferent to the Muslims. Bearing in mind that um, um, I think it was St. Pius V, um, who basically called a rosary crusade against the Muslims um, for the Battle of the Panto and called on Our Lady's help to win it. Um, and the, the church has always treated Muslims like that up until, uh, well, Vatican II, I guess, really. Um, but the it was Palm Sunday was the uh, jihadi ma massacres at two churches in Egypt and um, it was instead instead of the Muslims reaching out to Catholics to say oh you know we're sorry we're tolerant it's the other way around it's you know the the, the side that was wronged um, was actually going to Egypt and reaching out to them as Bergoglio did yeah perfectly crazy you know as usual uh, so. Uh... Uh, you know, again, it 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 really doesn't surprise one as as uh, regards what he's as regards to what he's up to. You know, the uh, Islam is the religion of peace, et cetera, et cetera. What uh, if Francis did, uh, I think, at at some point at one speech, was uh, denounced extremism and fundamentalism that's found in all sorts of religions, and uh, again, an opportunity to uh, slam. Uh, Anyone in uh, any Catholics who who still believed in uh, you know object, uh, objective principles of any sort, because these these are that's his code word is is uh, uh, fundamentalism. And uh, you know, are the the Muslims going to listen to this guy? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, listen to his exhortations about how the religion is supposed to be really a religion of peace. And the answer is, of course not. Of course, they're not mm -hmm. going to listen to it. Uh, you know, they don't care what he says. Uh, they're, in many uh, respects, they're as stupid as he is because they, uh, uh, the, the lower classes, uh, think of him as you know, sort of the head of the crusaders. You know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that's about as far from far from the truth as you could get. Calling um, uh, Bergoglio, you know, the caped crusader. I mean, uh, it's. Uh, it, it, uh, it's something that's absolutely absurd. So it's it's uh, you know more crazy, uh, more crazy discourse. The other thing that was that I had um, I'd intended to look up but haven't uh, been able quite to um, track down was this this idea of 
um, accepting the baptism among the Copts. I never thought that there was a problem for that, because the, um, my impression is that they use the standard um, uh, Eastern Orthodox formula for an Eastern Catholic formula for baptism, and there was no uh, 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 no difficulty whatsoever recognizing the validity of it. Yeah, I, I was surprised to see that too. And don't forget, these people are monophysites. They are heretics. They are not merely schismatics. In other words, the, the, the central issue is not merely the, the primacy of the Pope. But they, they are ancient monophysites. Uh, uh, and, and so they're, they go way back as uh, um, uh, people who are heretics to the, to the fifth century. Uh, and uh, so, um, so I, I don't know. That, that, I, I thought you would know the answer to that, Father Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd have to um, uh, drag Capello off the shelf. Not Capello personally, but uh, he, he is... <laughs> uh, I think he's, uh, he's resting in peace in Rome, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think he, is, he, think, think he is resting in peace in Rome. Uh, let me he's get him off the shelf. Peace, he's probably spinning in his grave. He's in oh, he is, I'm sure. He, he is, I'm sure. Hold on a second, I'll get it. He's in the, the Church of St. Ignatius in Rome. And uh, so... He probably sees some things that that uh, we'd rather skip. <laughs> uh, just just a brief uh, for our listeners while Father Chicardo pulls the text off his shelf. Um, so the 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 culmination of the visit um, f in, for Pope Francis and Pope um, they had a, there was a meeting between Pope Francis and Pope Todd. Um, Tordros, not not, not Tordry, but T Tordros, um, and they will make the Roman Catholic Church and the Coptic Orthodox Church recognise baptisms conducted by each other. Um, and I, I sent you, my Lord and uh, Father, the, the agreement. Yes. And I'm, I'm just just looking through it now, and it's um, a lot of the a lot of the wordings very very wishy washy. But there's a nice a nice line um, at bullet seven which says. As we journey towards the blessed day when we were at last gather at the same Eucharistic table, we can cooperate in many areas and demonstrate in a tangible way the great richness which already unites us. I thought they were schismatic. How can they be united? Yeah, they're heretics too. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's a whole other show. But uh, yeah. sacredness of marriage, they all the Orthodox uh, uh, recognize divorce and remarriage, and so do the Novosordites. So uh, uh, the family, you know, the, that doesn't work too well into LGBT, uh, uh, respect for all creation and so forth. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but the, what is most important is in number eight of that, uh, where it says religious freedom, including freedom of conscience, rooted in the dignity of the person is the cornerstone of all other freedoms it is a sacred and inalienable right that is a condemned doctrine it's condemned by the roman catholic church so uh he and it it shows that the that the Novus Ordo interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, which is the Declaration on Religious Liberty, is in fact unorthodox. Uh, you could, if you substitute for religious freedom, just, just, the way, just put the freedom to have an abortion, including, you know, rooted in the dignity of the person is the cornerstone of all other freedoms. So if you just put in that for religious freedom, it sounds horrifying, but religious freedom, that is the idea to embrace an error, that you have the right from God to embrace an error concerning him, a heresy, for example, is worse than abortion. So a freedom to heresy is worse than saying a freedom to abortion. See, so it, in fact, it's heresies that breed abortions because if this country were submitted to the true law of the true God, it would prohibit abortions just as any other country would. See, it's heresy that engenders all of the other evils of society. It's bad ideas, bad ideas concerning morality, and morality comes from religion. There's, a, there's an interesting point further on in, in number 11. Um, um, it's about halfway through that paragraph. It says, 
we confess in obedience to the holy scriptures and the faith of the three ecumenical councils assembled in Nicaea, Constantinople and Ephesus. Ephesus. I, I didn't think we... Ephesus. I didn't think we had any ecumenical councils beforehand. Uh, no, the first... Before Vatican II. Oh, oh yes. Ecumenical simply means the whole church. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, it comes from the Greek word oikumene, which means household. And it means that it's, it distinguishes it from a local council. But what you're confusing is the word ecumenical as it refers to ecumenism. Yeah, that's... But an ecumenical council is, uh, is sometimes it's called a general council. Uh, so yes, the first one was in 325. And uh, so, uh, yes, they don't... Uh, except Chalcedon, which uh, condemned monophysitism. <laughs> that was the fourth ecumenical. And uh, so, uh, and that's where the, uh, the fathers of the council, uh, uh, who were mostly from the East, uh, said uh, concerning Pope Leo the Great that Peter speaks through Leo. See, so that is somewhat embarrassing for the Greek Orthodox. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but in number nine, he has a heresy here. Uh, uh, quote, the tragic experiences and the blood shed by our faithful who were persecuted and killed for the sole reason of being Christian remind us all the more that the ecumenism of martyrdom unites us and encourages us along the way to peace and reconciliation. Well, that's against Florence, the Council of Florence, right? It's directly against the Council of Florence that says even if you know, heretics shed their blood, for Christ, that that it does not justify them, and they are not martyrs. Uh, and uh, as far as Saint Paul writes, uh, this this document goes on, quote: If one member suffers, all suffer together. So that means they're members of the mystical body of Christ, which is the Catholic Church, uh, even though they're monophysites and schismatics, which is a heresy. I found the answer, by the way, in the question of baptism. And that's why it, it, the, the declaration at that point struck me as utterly crazy, because it, Capello says that the uh, form of baptism is ego te baptizo nomine patris et fidi et spiritus sancti. Amen. Uh, it's the same as the uh, uh, Catholic formula. Well, c could it be that the Copts did not accept the Catholic baptism for some reason? Well, that is probably the uh, uh, that's probably the um, explanation for it. Uh, yes. That some Orthodox churches don't accept the validity of Catholic baptisms, but mm -hmm. the um, uh, I don't know what the position would be of of the Copts. But in, in the one of the things that was was interesting, and I read quite a bit on the history of the Copts um, in connection with my article on the new rite of Episcopal consecration, is that uh, precisely because of the suppression and persecution uh, over centuries and centuries and centuries, their theology was all really primitive. They, they really didn't have much of an idea um, of, uh, in, in, in terms of what they were talking about dogmatically, or even consistency in their their ritual practice, so it, it may have been that that uh, they, for some reason, did not accept the validity of Catholic baptisms, even though the form was the same. Mm -hmm. So it's it's again another example of Bergoglio uh, pandering to someone else um, rather than, as they're supposed to do, come back to the Holy Catholic Church. Oh yeah, sure, of course it is. Of course it is. Oh wow. So, um in other news, uh, just to just to close out the show. Um if you don't like this pope, um the other one's still going strong. And this this was uh um unfortunately, um Ratzinger and I have something in common, so we share the same birthday. So this was Easter Monday and uh um, so he recently had his birthday um, on Easter Monday. Did Ratzinger? So he's he's still going. He's still going strong. So if uh, um, hopefully Bergoglio follows through his plan and retires um, at the end of uh, his his liberal uh, agenda, um, there'll be there'll be two mm -hmm. Pope Emeriti. 
I think that's a good, yes, good plural, right. isn't it? Emeriti. Yes, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll be waiting there in, in the day room in front of it to watch television. <laughs> Daytime television. <laughs> or they could do those anti-dementia games, you know, like, you know, which pope suppressed to this or which, you know. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those. Yeah, you know, they... they so. uh, oh, yeah, I've sure. Seen those. Uh, they certainly won't be having any games where they test out no, large they, on the Catholic faith that models, be, that's for certain. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think I think uh, that's that's a good. Uh, we'll, we can uh, draw stumps there. That's a good uh, good point to draw stumps. No, yeah, there's that. one. There's a there's. What does that mean? Um, like wrap it up. Yep, yeah, wrap it up. Yeah. So um, ah. you guys have the draw stumps. You guys in America have the heretical game called baseball, where you um, <laughs> you throw a, a a large a cork object at a pitcher and he hits it and gets a home run and stuff like that. So we have. It's the the original game is called cricket, and um, the the two batsmen run between uh, in, on a set distance, run between um, a set of stumps, and on the top of the stumps are what's called bales. And when you draw the stumps, um, basically means you know end the game. So that's a. Uh, there you go. There you ah, go. okay. Ah, I see. Ah. Very interesting. Yes. Ah. I'll have to remember that one when the next time I go to England. You oh. know, someone, well, it was one of my French seminarians that said he listened to my sermon that I gave in England and it sounded as though I had a British accent. But I don't think I did. Did you? You didn't hear anything That's, like uh, that. Did you? That's, that's, be that's because we're rubbing off on you, my lord. You're, uh, you're showing your true class. <laughs> well, I hope I end up with a high-class British accent oh, if you, I do. Your, your accent, <laughs> yeah. um, along the lines of Matthew Gaskin's accent, very, 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 very <laughs> posh and very measured. I think if you you had a British accent. Uh. Um, All right. Well, I'm working on it. So I always threaten I'm going to give, a, you know, do a full-blown sermon with a full-blown British accent all the way through and, and see the reaction of the people as I speak. <laughs> Getting pretty good. I, I tried it on, on uh, Matthew and I was going around England with him. He says, oh, you're pretty good. <laughs> You could, if you try that with Americans, Your Excellency, like Bishop Williamson, you could yes. talk total nonsense, and they would say, "Oh yes, it's, it's just absolutely wonderful, it's brilliant, etc." And uh, he got away with that for years. <laughs> um, as, as our listeners are probably aware, the, the bishop um, recently came to uh, the UK. So uh, since since we last saw you, my lord, what have, what what have you been up to? Well, not so much what I've been up to as everybody else, uh, we've uh, packed off, well, in principle, we've packed off Father Palma to California, where he will help Father Zapp uh, and run a school uh, together with some of our nuns. And then we've packed off uh, Father Eldrocker to Australia, uh, where he will uh, be the priest for the people in Melbourne. And uh, hopefully we'll eventually say Mass for other people in, in Australia. And uh, so that, that has been a sort of, a, a, you know, a, what would you say, a, an event for us. Also, I recently launched our long-awaited uh, institute, uh, an organization of priests and seminarians uh, with, um, uh, uh, you know, with rules for everybody. Nothing new. I mean, you won't notice anything different about what we do or think or say. Uh, it's just that it, it, it sets down a, a way of acting uh, for everybody, a way of thinking for everybody. Uh, as I said in my introduction to it, that what has caused all the fighting among priests in the traditional movement is that everybody came in with different ideas about it. And so you get into an organization or you, you get into a relationship with other priests and then you start fighting because your ideas about what should be done or how to look at the Novus Ordo or whatever the case should be is different from others. And so you start fighting. So I decided that it would be best to put everything down on paper. Everybody sign off on it. Uh, that that uh, this is what we stand for, not only in theological matters, but also in pastoral matters and liturgical matters, uh, so that there won't be any fighting and everybody knows where we stand. And so I, I'm hopeful that that will, will uh, you know, I have to think of succession. I'm 67 years old, I'm, you know, I'm in pretty good shape. 
But you, you know, you have to think down the line, and uh, I would never want anything to go astray or off the rails the way others have. And so I'd like to, you know, to that's, that's why I did it. See, so. Uh, uh, you know the priests are happy with it, and uh, you know. So, I'll put out uh, a, a separate news thing every once in a while on what we're doing. You know, sort of uh, keeping up with with the activities of it. Once in a while, I'll put out one of those. And that, that's in your latest newsletter, isn't it, my lord? Yes, it is. Yes, it's uh, so. Um, uh, so. Uh, and you know, I hope that God blesses its undertakings. But as I said, it's really just putting into cement and concrete what we already say, do, and think. There is, there's really nothing new in it. You know, you will not know really that this is an organization, uh, except that you might get a newsletter once in a while from it. That's all. <laughs> Father, uh, how? Uh, well, the the, the uh, Cincinnati report is this: that uh, <laughs> successful Holy Week as usual. And um, what I, I, I did um, is um, over the past three or four weeks, uh, I managed to send out a number of um, uh, videos uh, with audios of our choir. And they've actually been doing some pretty wonderful music. It's, it's very impressive. So um, I put those out on the Work of Human Hands YouTube site where I have my other, um, uh, some of my polemical um, Films and then uh, the uh, videos on uh, the um, chapters of work of human hands. So that that's uh, uh, that's one new thing, and that's stirred up you know uh, a bit of interest. Uh, the preservation of of uh, good Catholic church music has always been a uh, uh, something that I've I've um, uh, that's been near and dear to my heart. So there's that, and then our um, uh, we uh, decided that we would um, organize here, or rather have lay people organize here, a young adults gathering. Uh, this was something that we did uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago with a great deal of success. And uh, the, uh, a lot of good contacts um, resulted from it. And uh, in fact, a number of marriages down the line resulted from us, uh, from it. And in the different chapels that where um, we serve and that that uh, are uh, connected with us one way or another. Now there's a considerable generation of, of young people who, uh, you know, would be interested in this sort of thing. So it's a both a, a fun and a social and a spiritual weekend that we're putting together for them. And that will be from the 7th through the 9th of July. And let's see, you can get information on that. Um, by going to YAG, Y-A-G in Cincy, YAG standing for Young Adult Gathering or Get Together in Cincy. And, or you can send an email to me or contact our crack office staff here at St. Gertrude the Great and we will uh, uh, pass along uh, registration information to you, uh, et cetera. So that we're, uh, uh, trying to, um, uh, promote that and let us know if you're interested. Brilliant. Well, I think that um, wraps up another great episode of Francis Watch. Thank you for listening to Francis Watch, and thank, thank you, my Lord and Father, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Francis Watch. If you have any questions about anything you've heard on today's episode, please email questions at truerestoration.org. We want to remind you that Francis Watch is a production of member-supported Restoration Radio. All rights are reserved, and any duplication without explicit written permission is forbidden. To obtain permission, please write to copyright at truerestoration.org. All of us here at member-supported Restoration Radio hope that you found this show to be informative, helpful, and beneficial to you and your faith. In return, please think of offering a mass, a rosary, or even a simple ave for our work the next time you pray. For the restoration... I am Dan Fitton. May God bless you.
This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org. That's NovusOrdoWatch.org.